Well, Merry Christmas. We've reached the 24th, which uh, for me, at least sometime today on the 24th typically, is when you finally get to the part of Christmas where you can start to actually relax and enjoy and celebrate after the days or weeks of preparing to celebrate, right? Um, and, and that's good, and I, I, whenever I get to this point of the Christmas celebration, I, I, I kind of reflect a little bit and wonder if all of that work and hustle and chaos leading up to it was really worth it, right? Because if we're honest, some of the things we do to celebrate Jesus' birth don't necessarily draw us closer to him. I mean, there's a lot going on this time of year that can actually detract from our relationship with the Lord. There's a lot of financial pressure, uh, that can kind of be drawn into materialism. There's a lot of meeting the expectations of friends and family. And, oh, are they getting a gift for me? Are they spend, am I spending the right amount on that? You know, thinking about approval of people instead of our relationship with the Lord. And we just get so busy and hectic that it can be hard to just take time to, to pray and be in the Word and be reflecting on our relationship with God. And it makes us wonder what what's the point well, what's the point of celebrating christmas why are we going through all of this and, and some folks don't celebrate christmas for that very reason and yet i think we don't really have a choice we don't have to call it celebrating we don't have to do all of that craziness and all of that hecticness necessarily but when we come to a day that is set aside to remember the birth of jesus we have to respond, don't we? Because Jesus Christ is a gift that God has given to us. And when you get a gift, you have to respond. Because even if you don't respond, you're kind of responding, right? I, I'm sure most of you are going to be opening gifts uh, later if you haven't already with friends and family and, and uh, you probably have some people that you care about and you got them a gift and you really thought about it and you're really excited and you're going to be watching carefully when they open the gift because you want to capture that response. Not that they owe anything to you, but as the giver of the gift, you're interested in how they receive it. And you're hopeful that they'll receive it with joy. You're hopeful that their response will reveal something about their attitude toward the gift and toward you as the giver. And so this morning, as we look at this very familiar passage, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. I want us to be thinking about how we respond to the birth of Jesus. Because a, a response can be revealing. A response can give a window into our heart, our attitude toward the giver and toward the gift. And that's the title of our message this morning. It's a, a revealing response. We're going to be in Luke chapter tw uh, 2, verses 1 through 20. I'll be reading from the New International Version. If you have a different translation, please go ahead and turn there this morning. We, we're not even going to have the scripture on the screen this morning, so hopefully you've got, got a Bible you can follow along with uh, this morning. Uh, let's begin with the first four verses of this uh, very familiar passage here. It said, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So Luke is giving us a historical setting here for this story that's going to take place. Uh, Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome, the the people of Israel had been conquered right by Rome. Rome was a foreign oppressor. And uh, they not only were conquered by Rome, they were ruled, governed by Rome, and that meant they had to pay taxes to Rome. And, and as part of that, Rome needed to assess the population of the different regions, and so that's the purpose of this census, right? It's their version of the IRS uh, enacting this census. Now, I don't like filling out the 1040, but this is worse, right? Joseph and Mary had to travel on foot 
almost certainly, a, a long way to, to go to be in Bethlehem because that's where Joseph's family was from. It, it was inconvenient. It was probably difficult. And it was a reminder that they were a conquered people. And yet, as we've seen all through the Gospel of Luke so far, as we've looked at these birth narratives, God does things in surprising ways. Because we have kind of a situation here. Uh, Joseph and Mary are from Nazareth. Jesus is going to be born in Nazareth. But Nazareth didn't even exist when the Old Testament was written. The prophecies say the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, God could have come up with any number of ways to make sure that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But he uses the tax policy of a foreign oppressor. Nobody saw that coming, right? And yet that's how he does things, right? He doesn't do things the way we expect him to, the way we want him. He does not necessarily the easy way, but he does things in surprising ways to show us that he's in control, his plan is coming forward, and yet it's never going to be the plan you or I would make. So Joseph and Mary, they arrive in Bethlehem, and the child is born. Look at verses uh, 5 through 7 with me. It says, He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, maybe if you're reading a, a slightly older translation, it says uh, there's no, no room for them in the inn. That's sort of the traditional translation. The, the Greek word here is katalima, which often, in fact, more often than not, refers to actually a room that was used for hospitality. It's the word that's used to describe the room where Jesus and his uh, disciples eat the Last Supper. It, it could refer to an inn, that's possible, but that's not the most common usage of it. In fact, this is caused debate among scholars. Well, was he even really born in a stable? Maybe he was born in the family quarters because often animals were there sleeping with the families and there could have been a manger there. And I don't want to get into all of that this morning because I want us to focus not on that word catalema, but on the detail that Luke draws our attention to. And that is the very surprising detail that she laid him in a manger. Whether it was in a stable or in the family quarters, surrounded by animals, laying a child in a manger would have been unexpected, right? That's a surprising cradle. It's certainly not anything you would expect for a future king, for the promised Messiah. It's not a glorious thing. It's, it's not anything that you would boast about. Oh, I was, when I was born, I was laid in a manger. And yet, it's practical. It would have been warm. It would have been comfortable. And it shows again how God is doing things in surprising ways. And it also highlights the humility of Christ. This is the detail that, that Luke wants us to focus on. And we know that it was a worth noteworthy detail because it's the one that the angel is going to use here in a few verses to tell the shepherds to look for, right? A baby in a manger. There's only going to be one. That's not a common thing. And as we have said before, when Luke includes these details in the birth narrative, he's not just giving us information. He's helping to shape our expectations for the kind of Messiah that Jesus will be. What will his life and ministry be like? And by this surprising detail, uh, defying our expectations that he's laid in a manger as an infant begins to shape our picture of the kind of of life and ministry he's going to be going to have it's going to be humble it's it's going to be the kind of thing that a lot of people would overlook or look down upon and yet it is going to demonstrate god's faithfulness in the midst of that humility i'm so grateful that the stories of christmas in the bible emphasize the simplicity and humility of jesus birth because our culture, when it comes to Christmas, kind of goes on the other extreme, right? I, I don't know if you, I, I've seen some of these clips online this week of different Christmas services being put on at 
these uh, churches with you know laser shows and and full-on Broadway productions now and, and that, that's all cool like I, I can see why people enjoy that um, but you know a, as a pastor it could, could feel a little insecure look watching something like that and then then coming with a projector that doesn't work and singing a cappella hymns together right and yet when I look at the story of Christmas you know what we're kind of closer to that aren't we because because jesus doesn't value the, the big production the showy stuff the things that impress the world he comes in humility laid in a manger and so that's maybe the best way to worship him we have a surprising cradle we also have a surprising announcement of jesus birth look at verses eight and nine and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. We've become so familiar with this idea of the angels and the shepherds at Christmas time that I think we lose the power of the juxtaposition that Luke is pointing out to us. Shepherds were at the bottom of the social pyramid, right? They, they were often migrant workers. We know even from our own culture, migrant workers have a hard time really fitting into society. They, they tend to be marginalized, tend to be looked down upon. They, they were often uh, ceremonially unclean because of their work, which meant they couldn't be uh, participating in the religious life of a good Jewish person. And so they were seen as irreligious and, and kind of not very spiritual. They, they didn't make a lot of money, they didn't have a lot of social standing, and they kind of had a reputation for being morally lax, whether that was justified or not, it was often a stereotype. And, and these are the people that the birth of the Messiah is announced to by an angel from heaven. Now we've already seen some surprises here, right? That, that uh, an anonymous teenager from Nazareth already was visited by an angel and, and chosen to be the one to bear the son of god and it's emphasized again with this this surprising announcement to these shepherds and again luke is communicating to us what kind of messiah jesus is going to be he's not going to focus his ministry on the priests and the ruling class and the wealthy although he will interact with them but he's going to give a disproportionate at least from the expectations of society a disproportionate amount of his time and energy to the people on the bottom uh, to the people that are looked down upon to the people that are seen as spiritual outsiders a and that groundwork is being laid for us even with the announcement of his birth look at the announcement with me in verses 10 through 12 the the shepherds are terrified as anyone would be having seen an angel and it says this but the angel said to them do not be afraid I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Good news. It's going to bring great joy for all the people. And this... That, that phrase, for all the people, is, is really driven home by the people that are hearing this message, right? Because if they're part of all the people, everybody's going to be part of all the people. And it's, it's going to cause great joy. The Messiah, the one that has been promised, the one that the people of Israel have been looking forward to, is finally being born, and he's going to be the Savior. Some folks are going to have to adjust what exactly it is they think they need to be saved from but he's going to be the savior they were looking for and then the shepherds are given a sign god gives signs frequently in the bible to reassure his people to encourage his people to let them know that what he says he is doing he is actually doing that he has the power and intention to follow through on it and yet whenever god gives a sign there's always the expectation that the people will respond in some way. Even if that response is simply to trust him, to believe him, to, to hold fast to him. 
there's an implied response. And here's the thing, with the gift of Jesus Christ, just like that gift that you open on Christmas with the giver watching your face eagerly, with the good news about Jesus' birth, a response is expected. A response is demanded. In fact, lack of a response is a response, right? We have to respond to this good news. We have to react to it. We, however we respond communicates something about our heart, something about our attitude toward Jesus. And immediately after this news is declared, we begin to see the responses to this news. And the first response we see is the response of heaven itself. Look at verses 13 and 14. The news is declared, and this is the response from heaven. It says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. There's a proclamation. The proclamation is this, that, that God favors, God is giving grace to those on earth. And he... As an extension of that grace, as an as a expression of that favor, he is declaring peace. Remember, we talked about that Hebrew concept of shalom, peace, last week. It, it's not just an absence of conflict. It's an invitation into deep fellowship, into right living, a, a connection with God. This is what God desires, and he is proclaiming it. That's the proclamation from heaven. But do you notice, before that proclamation is even made, what the response is? of the heavenly host is, that God is doing this by sending the Savior, that he's sending a Savior to, to make peace possible, to demonstrate his grace and favor to mankind. They're glorifying God. They're praising and worshiping God. And what else could they possibly do? God is doing this amazing thing, and a response is necessary. So, of course, the shepherds, too, have to respond. And they do. Look at verse 15 and 16. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who were lying in the manger. The shepherds' first response when they're told about the birth of Jesus is to seek out jesus it's a response of seeking and there's faith there right they, they have to believe that what the angel told them is true and there's some intentionality and some effort there right it doesn't just happen they have to like go do it and they find him we're going to see other responses from them here momentarily but the initial response to the good news about jesus is that we must seek Jesus out. That begins for most of us when we make that initial decision to trust Jesus as the only one that can solve the problem of sin in our life, that can reconcile us to God, that can bring us into that relationship of peace that God desires to have with us. We have to seek him out to be that savior and, and to be the, the ruler of our lives. And yet, as we go about our lives, once we've made that decision, and, and things like work and family and Christmas come along, we can start to lose sight of him, can't we? And yet, we've been given a sign. We've been told what Jesus looks like. The, the shepherds were given a, a detailed picture. We're given a detailed picture in the Gospels of who Jesus is and what he's about. We're given a detailed picture of how he shows up in our lives in the New Testament when we're told about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and what it looks like when he shows up in our lives. And we need to sometimes take the time to respond to his presence by seeking him out. Where is Jesus showing up in my life? What does it look like when Jesus is showing up in my life? Can I, can I take a break from what I'm doing to actively seek him out? What a beautiful way to respond to the gift of Jesus that he brings. They find the baby. They, they find him as they seek him. And then we get another element of response here in verses seven, uh, yeah, 17 and 18. It says, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning 
what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They seek Jesus, they find him, they realize that what has been said about him is true, and they spread the word. They can't help themselves. They're overflowing with this good news, and they have to share it. We're told that all the, that heard it were amazed. Uh, the, the implication there isn't necessarily as positive as we might associate with that word amazed. It doesn't necessarily mean that they agreed. Uh, amazed, the, the word there in the Greek can uh, imply disbelief or, or shock or uh, this doesn't make sense to me. The thing that's driving the shepherds forward isn't that everybody is excited to hear the news. The thing that's driving the shepherds forward is that they're excited about the news. And isn't that just a natural response when, when something really good comes into your life? I, I mean, this is why all the kids, when they go back to school, right, their, their teachers are probably going to have them share about what they got at Christmas, right? Because we love to tell people about the good gifts that come into our lives. Or, or when someone's in a new relationship and they're just so excited about it, and it's almost like, okay, okay, we, we get it. And they just can't stop talking about it, right? Because they're overflowing with the, the, this excitement and this joy of this good new thing. When Jesus is part of your life and you understand who he is and what's true about him and how good it is, you're going to share it. It's just natural. It's not a sense of duty. It's not a sense of obligation. It's not even really about whether the other person responds the way you think they should. It's just an overflow of the goodness of who Jesus is when he enters into your life. And that's how we re should respond to his birth. If we really understand its goodness, if we really appreciate what a good gift it is, we're going to share it naturally as an overflowing of our joy. We have one more response and it's modeled in two contrasting ways, but I really think it's two sides of the same coin, two aspects of the same kind of response to Jesus' birth. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. It says, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Mary has a quiet response, a reflective response, a, a sort of internal response. She, she's soaking up these things that God is doing, preparing her heart, preparing herself to be the mother to this child. Can't imagine how overwhelming the prospect of that must have been for, for this teenage girl. I mean, motherhood to begin with, but to, to raise the Messiah? And so she's reflecting on what God has done and what God is doing. She's focusing on, on God's goodness and grace that's been displayed to her. Even the visit from the shepherds must have been so encouraging to her. And she's storing it up and she's reflecting and, and she's focusing on God's goodness in a quiet, internal way. The shepherds, on the other hand, are, are focusing on God's goodness in a loud, boisterous, external way, praising Him, declaring it to one another and to themselves. And both are appropriate, but both share the same focus. God is good. The birth of Jesus displays God's goodness and his faithfulness to us. And that is where the focus should be. And anything we do to celebrate Christmas that brings our focus onto God's goodness and his faithfulness, whether that's quiet and understated and humble or, or loud and boisterous and showy, uh, any, any of that can be good if our, we have a right focus, a focus on God's goodness, a focus on what about God's character is being displayed in the surprising birth of Jesus. God works in unexpected ways in the birth narrative surrounding Christ. It's, it's a surprising Savior. And it communicates something about that Savior to us. He's humble. He's not coming to uh, shame. He's not coming to divide. He's not coming to put us in our place. He's coming to save us and to rescue us. But, but not in the grand, glorious, conquering king way we might expect or desire. He's coming in humility to invite us to share in that humility, to be part of that, to have shalom with him. And when we understand that, when we get a glimpse of that gift, 
our response reveals something about us, right? Do we want to share in that? Do we want that kind of Savior? Is it really good news to us that brings us great joy that that is the way God chooses to enter the world, that that is the way that God wants to enter our lives? And if it is, well, it, the, that surprising birth should prompt us to respond to, in the ways we see the shepherds responding here. It should prompt us to seek him. It should prompt us to share him. And it should prompt us to focus on God's goodness, which is displayed in him and in his birth. That's really the, the big idea, I think, of this passage that Jesus' surprising birth should prompt us to seek him, share him, and focus on him. And if we think of our Christmas celebrations as a response, and we can identify the different things that we're doing as expressions of seeking Jesus, sharing Jesus, and bringing our focus onto God's goodness expressed through the birth of Jesus, then, then it probably, there's probably an infinite number of ways to celebrate. They can all be good. But if our celebrations don't respond in these ways, if they don't draw us closer to Christ, if they don't cause us to seek Him out, if they don't share the true nature of this surprising Savior with those around us, if they don't cause us to focus on God and His goodness, then we're really not celebrating Christmas, are we? We're celebrating something else. So we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to respond today and tomorrow as we celebrate Christmas? How are we going to respond in the days and weeks and months ahead as we continue to seek to have our lives shaped by this surprising Savior? How can we seek Him? Where does Jesus want to show up in your life? What does it look like to actively seek Him to have a, a, a greater presence in your life? Maybe that's more time in the Word. Maybe that's more time with His people. Maybe that's more time in prayer. Maybe that's just about quieting our minds and our hearts just enough so that we can be more receptive to what he's already trying to do. How do we share him? It doesn't have to be a program. It doesn't have to, to be a, a, you know, knocking on doors necessarily. But if he is filling our hearts with joy, are we seeing that come out in our lives? Is it just natural for us to talk about him because of how good he is? And then how do we focus on him? How do we focus on the goodness of God displayed in this surprising and humble Savior? What disciplines do we need to incorporate into our lives? What practices can we enact to help us stay focused on God's goodness expressed in the birth of Jesus Christ? We don't have a choice. We're going to respond to Christmas one way or another. Let's ask God to help us respond in the way that is appropriate to the goodness of his gift. Father God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for all the surprising ways that he defies our expectations. We thank you that he came to save all people, including us. We thank you that he values humility. We thank you that he comes to bring us an invitation to peace with you because you've chosen to favor us. And we thank you for the example of the shepherds and of Mary who responded to that birth in the right way, in a way that demonstrates the goodness of your gift. And we ask, Lord, that this Christmas and going forward beyond this Christmas, you would help us to respond in our hearts and minds in a way that is appropriate, that we would seek Jesus, that we would share him out of an overflow of our joy in who he is, and that we would focus on your goodness as expressed in him. Pray all this in his name.